Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, you guys sound like you're stressed out. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. You gotta wake up. So I'm DeAndre. I'm with Ant. Uh, we've partnered with the SBDC and Trilates to put on these free educational classes for business owners or anyone, in this case, anyone who's feeling uh, a little stressed out at work. Uh, if you like me, probably you are. If you like Melissa, you can see what she did to her board already. <laughs> so, Ants has been part of the community now for over 55 years. We are the largest credit union in Colorado. We're the largest financial institution in Southern Colorado, and we are growing. Um, you're going to see a lot of our buildings going up. We're going in Parker, we'll be in Highlands Ranch, Fort Collins, probably Boulder. So we are definitely a, a place to be. So if you enjoy this and you enjoy my presentation that I just said, grab my card, give me a call. If you're not banking with us, give me a call, shoot me an email. I love to sit down and go over everything uh, that we have to offer. So. One thing uh, before I turn it back over, restrooms are straight through that door. Um, you'll see them right there. And to keep these classes going for the SBDC, please make sure you sign your name. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Healy. She's a wellness coach of Melissa Healy Wellness Coaching. She's been in the health industry for 30 years and is a national board certified health and wellness coach and works as a speaker trainer and retreat facilitator. She's brought her workshops and training to the Colorado Springs community, to business fitness centers, networking groups, and nonprofit organizations, and we're so happy to have her here with us. And if you have any questions after this workshop, please feel free to talk to her and ask for her business card and she'd love to help you. Thank you. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. It's spring of 2015, in the midst of year 15 of my pharmaceutical sales career. It was a Friday afternoon. I'm parked in front of my house, getting ready to go to happy hour with a friend of mine, but waiting for a call from my manager. The phone rings. I'm sitting in my car listening to the radio, all hyped up. He gets on the phone. He goes, Melissa, I know we are supposed to talk about your business and certain products, but first and foremost, I have a very important question to ask you. And he got really, really quiet. And he goes, I have to know, do you even like your job? <laughs> you see, at that time, going back about two months, we had had a conversation where I started to exhibit what in hindsight was probably borderline exception, uh, exceptional attitude. <laughs> um, I was frustrated. I was angry. The company had gone through a lot of changes and iterations. The CEO of our company at the time had said, if you don't like change, you are in the wrong industry. Clearly, I was exhibiting the signs of burnout. I would like to take a moment real quick because I appreciate that you guys are here and want to not put anyone on the spot, but is somebody willing to share either a current or a past experience of burnout themselves? Thank you, Brian. There were just awful, you know. There's no no windows, no clocks, so you never know what time it is. And there's cigarette smoke, you know, people drinking all the time. So I was popping the day pill pills like they were M&Ms. I was sick all the time and just stressed out and depressed. And then, you know, when I moved out here, you know, it was just a breath of fresh air. So yeah, I definitely reached that breaking point where I was just sick and tired, and I, I hated waking up every morning. Sick and tired of being sick and tired, mm -hmm. and a literal and figurative breath of fresh air, right? Yeah. Not the cigarette smoke here in Colorado. Anybody else? Thank you so much, Brianna. Well, there's different cigarette smoke here. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And what is your name? Stacy. Stacy. Um, I don't know if it's stress and burnout yet, but I go as a new business owner. I go through almost a daily process of is this worth it? Um, I'm doing, I'm doing fine, like I'm surviving, I, I 
exactly what he says. I survived the first year, but um, yeah, like just yesterday, I'm like, I put so much effort into this, mm -hmm. and I don't feel like I'm getting the returns of my effort. Um, and I'll use my piano concerts as an example. I had like probably a hundred people told me they were going to come to my piano concert on Sunday, and Sunday morning, everybody has an excuse. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, why, why am I spinning my wheels here to do something that I think is meaningful, but maybe other people don't? So for me, it's like daily ups and downs, like, yay, I had a piano concert, mm -hmm. but 50 people that said they were going to come didn't come. Okay. So I guess it's, maybe, I mean, maybe burnout because I'm just like working so hard and 80 <laughs> hours a week to right. just be able to pay the bills. So I'm wondering, like, I don't know, should I just go get a job at somewhere where I know that I have a nine to five schedule? And you know what to expect and your yeah. efforts are rewarded. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Stacey. Anyone else have a similar feeling to that? Are solopreneurs in here? Mm -hmm. Yes, our business owners and bigger businesses. So yeah, those are great stories and I appreciate you sharing. Before we get started, also I'd like to know real quick, you came here for a reason. You had some desired outcome from it. And I would like to know real quick, if anyone's willing to let me know, what is your biggest question you hope to have answered by this discussion today? Do you mind? Uh, just, what's a good daily practice? Okay. okay. I don't know when to stop. Mm -hmm. When to stop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there's always, yeah, yeah, there's always more that you can do. Right. In a new business, so like, how do you tell yourself, okay, you've done enough today? Mm -hmm. Where does it become the law of diminishing returns? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else have some question they hope to have answered today? How to manage my time so I'm not continually running out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? These are, yes. Prevention of burnout. Prevention, yes. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here to do. Build resiliency and prevention. Thank you, Austin. Anyone else have a question they hope to have answered? Maybe realistic benchmarks. Okay, that's a great question, yes. All right. These are wonderful. Thank you. So I want to share with you before we dive in what my intention is for you. Number one, that you figure out how to go from exhausted to invigorated, to where you're like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm excited and I'm inspired to keep going on. Where you go from overwhelmed to a sense of progress. Overwhelmed to a sense of progress, and where you go from feeling disconnected, especially when you're working by yourself, mm -hmm. to feeling a sense of support and collaboration and loyalty. So these are things that I hope to, you know, are outcomes, and as well as hopefully these questions will be answered for you. Burnout begins, <laughs> most of all, a perceived loss of control. <laughs> where you also feel like the challenges are just getting too great. Perceived loss of control, thinking the challenges are too great. Your goals no longer resonate with you, or the behaviors and the daily actions showing up for your life every day no longer feels in line with your values. There's a huge disconnect between what you're doing every day, what, your pur what you think your purpose is, and what's really going on. And ultimately, constant demand, start feeling like you're depleting your time, your efforts, your skills, your resources, right? So my experience with this was I was sitting in the car on that Friday afternoon. I felt a perceived loss of control. Definitely felt like what I was doing every day was no longer in line with my values. At this time, I was my manager's number one rep which probably gave me a little bit of grace there, right, in that moment. The thing about burnout, it is the great equalizer. It has nothing to do with where you are on the income spectrum. Regardless of how successful you are in a relationship, in business, as a parent. And what's interesting, too, and if you look at research about burnout, for solopreneurs, just so you know, 99%. If you haven't, if you're a solopreneur and you haven't experienced it yet, woo, your turn is coming. <laughs> Get excited. <laughs> and to me, it's also a zero to one degree of separation. If you personally are not burned out, 
you are likely closely connected to someone who's right there, or you have experienced it yourself. And it's how do you recognize that? And how do you address it, right? Um, amongst primary care providers, depending on what their specialty is, the rate is anywhere from 45 to 60%. Interestingly enough, full-time parents have about equal burnout rates to people who work full-time. So you can imagine full-time working parents is probably a little bit higher, right? It is very prevalent, very prevalent. Usually it, you start feeling extreme fatigue, a little bit of cynicism, you're impatient. Anyone have a really short temper these days? <laughs> anyone ever like just snapped and you didn't even recognize it You're like oh right and you sit there and go oh my ugly side just showed itself but I didn't even know I had it <laughs> and anxiety oftentimes you can even start exhibiting symptoms of depression and the key is to notice I'm exhibiting symptoms of depression and I need to put a kibosh on it before I come into full-blown clinical depression right so all these things start leading to it. It gets further. How many people start to feel a loss of confidence, right, in what you're doing? People aren't showing up. They're not meeting your expectations. You're like, that's on me. What am I doing wrong? That people aren't showing up. You told me they were going to be here. We take it very personally. We start to feel like a lack of boundaries. Let's go back to this time management. Anybody have an inability to say no? Anyone? <laughs> Say yes to inability to say no. Just three of you, I find that hard to believe. You get bored and bored. And does boredom in personal and professional life start to lead to impaired performance, right? You start going. And to me, burnout is like a hurricane over the water. It builds a lot of energy, size, and speed. And it gets out of control. It does a lot of damage. And you want to catch it before it goes back out to sea. For performance, Chronic health issues. A client, Sally, 20 years as an interior designer, really successful, made great money. But as anyone knows, with a successful business, you probably have a few people who are saying no, they don't pay, they don't show up, they're not happy with your service. She was a very type A personality, is a type A personality, and she got to about year 13, 14. And she started constantly having chronic health issues with heart murmur. And then it was a lesion that she had removed from her skin that could have been melanoma. Then she had eye issues. To this day, while she has it a little more under control, these chronic health issues have turned into things that she will literally have to treat for the rest of her life. They're that big. And that is a very common thing that happens is you get chronic health issues. Okay. So what happens is you begin to avoid and deny, right, that you are having any problem. You're a solopreneur. You're doing what you love. You're going to wake up every day and try to convince yourself you still love it, right, that you know you're doing what you're supposed to do. Perhaps you're like me. You start exhibiting signs of a bad attitude. Back to my story with my manager. In that moment, sitting in my car, my manager says, do you even like your job? And I got really quiet. I sat there, and without real hesitation, without apology, or any kind of defensiveness, I quite frankly said, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. And then there was complete silence. I even turned the radio off, just to like emphasize silence. <laughs> the next thing he said was, all right, Melissa, Usually in these cases, we go one of two ways. Either something has to change, in parentheses, you, me, <laughs> or it's time to part ways. And with absolute relief, and I will assure you in that moment, I actually didn't care how he answered this question. I said, are you ready to part ways? And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not ready to part ways. What I wanted to share this part of the story with is I was exhibiting signs of a bad attitude. To his credit, several months before, I had vented, I'd used him as my punching bag 
even in the midst of that call, I had said, I know this is not on you, but he was the person who received it. He later told me he took that conversation so personally, even though he knew in my head, but he was still the one being attacked. He felt so personal about it. He went home and told his wife, you are no longer allowed to be friends with her. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. tongue in cheek, absolutely. But still, it was that personal. I want to acknowledge something here. A lot of you may be here because perhaps you have or think you may be having burnout or you know someone who is. This, the way he handled this, if you have a takeaway, if you are with somebody exhibiting signs, is if you have the grace to do what he did. Step away, let the dust settle, come back with an open mind, an open heart, and ask without judgment and you know, without reservation. Find out what's going on. Sometimes people really do just have a really bad attitude. Absolutely. But what happens when this isn't handled correctly by yourself or someone else, you and the other people begin to have a buck up mentality. The CEO of the company, you don't like change? Go find something else to do. You have, you have no place here. Change is gonna happen. The thing is, people don't mind change. They don't like not having any control over it, or the perception that none of the changes, they feel the change is happening to them, not necessarily for them. Change in and of itself, we all know there's gonna be change. That's not what people have a problem with. And ultimately what happens is you <coughs> wait till too much damage is done. So that's where people leave relationships, right? In the midst of extreme burnout that's gone too far, they make rash, life-changing decisions. They quit their job. They get rid of an employee who's exhibiting signs of a bad attitude. He gave me an option. He gave me control of that choice. We part ways or something has to change. And then sometimes we leave jobs ourselves. In that moment, because I told you, I didn't care what he said. He could have said, yeah, we're done. And part of me would have been like, oh my God, right? It was not a good time for me to leave the job financially, couldn't do it. Had no idea what I would what I, what I would do. And quite frankly, if I'm burned out being a pharmaceutical rep, do you think the first and foremost thing I thought I would do was go get another job as a pharmaceutical rep? No. So I was gifted with catching it at exhibiting signs of a bad attitude and being given the option to figure out what I had to do. And I want to answer these questions today in the midst of this, but one thing I want to make perfectly clear. I am, you're not going to leave here with me having told you, if you are burned out, you just do these things and you'll be fine. The way this works, I'm going to share with you knowledge, backed up by research, skill sets that you can engage in. We're going to go through a little activity. You're going to leave here and start creating something of your own design, which will get you to that place. So here I am burned out, and I realized over that weekend, because he said, you know, go sit on it, think about it. Over the weekend, I realized I am not going to retire a pharmaceutical rep. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I ha I'm not ready to leave, so I have to make it where I can get up every day and still face this day. So over the course of the next few weeks, um, I, for the first time ever, tried meditating. Anyone else have just a rampant, busy mind that you're like, I can't meditate because my <laughs> never shuts off? Thankfully, that's okay. You can do that. Quite frankly, uh, meditation is one of the things that ultimately did work for me, but it, I started out, like, I think at 30 seconds to a minute for quite a while. I then decided with the um, brainstorming of neighbors and friends that I was going to become a health and wellness coach. It seemed ideal because I had a background in fitness. I am a chiropractor by education and had practiced for several years. And then I had been in the pharmaceutical industry for 15 years. I had this well-rounded education and work experience that made me think, oh, health and wellness coaching gives me, I have a unique perspective to bring to it. That's what I'm gonna do. Does that mean the next day I went and quit my job? No. I had a very long drawn out plan where I, I got certified as a coach, I started coaching nights and weekends. I told myself, when you turn 50, and you have X amount of money in the bank, you have permission to leave. That took another 18 months, okay? 18 months, 
and then I was able to go. But it was a well thought out plan, it was not a rash decision. I left four weeks after I was awarded rep of the year. Mm -hmm. Meaning, had I not come back from bad attitude, that wouldn't have happened. And what happens with that is, to Stacy's point, in the event I ever need to go back into the workforce, I left under the best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. But it, I'm not gonna tell you that that was an easy 18 months. The day I decided to quit was when the cost benefit of staying, the, the cost to me personally, I was like, stick a fork in me, I'm done. I called my new manager that I had never met in person at 8 a.m. on August 8, 2016 and said, bye-bye, I'm done. I haven't looked back. So I want you to leave here going, if she can create a system, because there is nothing special about me. <laughs> Thank you. If she can do it, so can I, but I have to start somewhere. All right. So my philosophy is the most effective strategy for building resilience, resiliency to stress is to actually prepare for it. If you're sitting here like, oh, my life is good, I'm not burned out, and I don't know anyone who is, you're going to. So just leave here with some ideas in mind. All right. What's interesting is you're suffering from a perceived loss of control, correct? What happens is you, when you get past that bad attitude to a buck up mentality, you go from a perceived loss of control to conceding. Conceding loss of control. You give it away, right? There's things you actually have control of, but you've decided, you know what? They've taken half of it, and I'm just hmm, hand them the rest of control over my life. You concede control. So you start back with really simple things. It's going to seem super basic. Sleep. Now, if you're my age, you may be like, yeah, 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 sorry. You have no control over your sleep when you reach a certain age. <laughs> or you're so stressed, okay? But sleep, start, if there is one thing you can do. In the book, The Science of Sleep, the number one thing you can do mentally, emotionally, and physically, physiologically for yourself is figure out a way to get quality sleep on a regular basis. Start with quality and then increase it to quantity. Quality sleep, number one thing. Now, ideally, find a way to get sleep without having to take medication and over-the-counter stuff. Not because it's not effective and it doesn't work and if you need it, by all means, start there. The reason is all of those things sedate you. They don't actually get you to REM sleep, which is where you get all the healing properties of it. So, just as a qualifier, I'm not telling you to not go put on, get put on sleep medication if you can't sleep. Just be aware that ideally you want to get to a place where you can actually sleep. That's the that's end goal. So take control of your sleep. Eating, eating. We're gonna talk about an animal later on who eats a lot of food. Has anyone ever had the phrase come out of their mouth, I forgot to eat, I got so busy I forgot to eat? Anybody ever said that? <laughs> yeah. It happens, it has happened to me, it's happened to me, you know, this summer I've been so busy. Um, but there's something you have control over. And again, the second most effective thing you can do mentally, emotionally, physically, and physiologically, is to be well-nourished. And if you're someone who finds yourself habitually not eating, the first thing, and this is my opinion, start with eating first. Worry about what it is you're eating next. Feed your body. Feed your body. You would not run your car, right, without oil and gas? Because what happens? You run your car without oil, you run the risk of burning up the engine, correct? Does anybody here take better maintenance of the car than they do themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> right? Eat. Start with eating, and then worry about what it is. Motion. Okay, has anyone ever heard of torticollis? Or know what it is? Yes. What is torticollis? Oh, I'm not sure of that. I see it. Extreme spasm and you can't move your head. Are you a chiropractor? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can't move your head. I had never had a torticollis before and I haven't had it since, but my last semester of chiropractic school, I got about six things just so I guess I could know how patients feel. You such extreme spasm, you can't move your head. Interesting thing about burnout, torticollis. You're incredibly stuck, right? 
Super stuck? I hate to tell you, but the most efficient way and natural way to get past being stuck is to move. Right? I had a patient come in and I said, you're not going to like me for a few minutes, but I'm going to take your head in my hands. And this, again, is in the absence of any acute injury, to be clear. I'm going to move your head. She had tears rolling down her face. And I said, and you're going to hate me even more because I'm going to tell you when you go home, I'm going to tell your spouse or family member to do this very thing to you at home. And she's like, ah, oh, but you know what? Within three days, she came back. She could move her head. Most natural way to get unstuck in life, physically, mentally, emotionally, is to move. And I put motion there instead of um, where I got this information. They said exercise. You say exercise and people are like, I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time, right? Motion, I don't care where you do it, you fit it into your day. Everyone has time to motion. In fact, let's stand up right now. Let's, let's prove that point. Stand up right now. I want you to walk around your table and sit down. That's how easy it is. That is how easy it is to incorporate motion into everyday normal life. Right? That took all of maybe 30 seconds. But it gives you that perception of I am not stuck, I am in control. I'm sitting in this cubicle in a room with no windows. I don't know what time of day it is. You know what I would suggest? Go walk outside and figure out what time it is, right? See if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's sunny. If it's really sunny, go for a walk around the building. Incorporate motion. Take control of sleep, eat motion, and daily decision making. Daily, how many people took more than three minutes to figure out what they were going to wear today? <laughs> That's the easiest thing, especially if you work nine to five or just have a Monday to Friday job. When I was a drug rep, I had three pairs of pants I rotated and five different tops, and I knew. The only thing that changed was weather, then I layered. Daily decision making. How many of you come home from work and somebody goes, what do you want to have for dinner? And you want to about take their head off. Right. <laughs> right? Do not make me make another decision today. <laughs> Begging you. Just put food on the table and I have a choice to eat it or not. And for God's sake, if I choose not to eat it, it is not personal. Right? It's not personal. <laughs> but you've been given food. You have a choice to eat it or not. And if you don't like it, go get your own. But don't sit there with a decision-making thing. Okay, daily decisions. Every morning for about 20 years, I have had a nutritional shake for breakfast. On weekends, I have the shake, and then maybe I go out for brunch with somebody, right? Or make myself pancakes or French toast, whatever. But in general, I drink the same thing, and it has all my nutrients in it, meaning if I choose not to eat another vegetable for the rest of the day, I am covered, right? Great way to make a decision. Minimize daily decisions. Do you go into your day every day? <laughs> Ain't they got some money? <laughs> That's hard to minimize. Yes. Yeah. But the thing is, it's hard because you don't think about it, right? So who here now, just planting that idea to minimize, who here can give me an idea of one decision you realize you could take off your plate moving forward? That you could just... Yes, Austin. Lay out the clothes you're wearing the next day to make the clothes. Yeah, lay out the clothes. Hang them up. Have them in front of you. I'm too tired from the day to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody else have a decision they could take out of their life? Just thinking about it off the top of their head? Really? Can't think of one area that you could stop making a decision? Frank? Uh, well, I probably can think of more than one. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, this now, going back to when you said saying else, so that's a decision that I can make that I haven't been very good at making. Okay. So. Just say no. How about how you drive to work every day? How you take your kids to school? What time you do certain things, right? There's just a schedule. Boom, boom, boom. There's probably a lot of ways you are mitigating decisions. You just don't think of it as that. But you can mitigate your decisions. Okay. 
So we're going to do this exercise. And I brought visual aids. So if you guys are willing to kind of pair up a little bit. <laughs> so what this is, is this was an exercise I got from a, a talk on burnout that I listened to. You take an, something unrelated to you and your problem, and then you try to compare your problem to it. The example in the class I took was a zebra, right? You have a visual of a zebra, the stripes, and you ask yourself, where's the gray area? You're sitting here burned out, feeling lack of control. Your values are never in line, no longer in line with your daily activity. Where is the gray area? Right? How can you stand out? Maybe you feel like you no longer bring value, you're invisible, you're not appreciated at what you do, whether it's as a parent, a solopreneur, or you work for somebody, or as a leader. How can you stand out? And, you know, the stripes going down the sides, how can you organize your life into columns to where you feel some control over it? Now, my example I liked is the hummingbird. Anybody see a lot of hummingbirds this summer in the yard and have hummingbird feeders? You always see them like this, correct? Well, do you know that they spend most of their time perched? They'll sit for hours just perched, resting, because they use up so much energy moving around. Do you know they eat two to five times an hour because they use so much energy with those wings? In Native American culture, hummingbirds are known as healers. They're known as a sign of joy and love, okay? So what I did was I took this hummingbird and said, where do I experience joy in my life? If I'm comparing my current life and I'm burned out to a hummingbird, where do I have joy in my life? How many people off the top of their head can think of one area they have joy in their life? Every single person raised their hand. When was the last time you asked that question? In the midst of being frustrated, at your wit's end, exhausted, too tired to put your clothes out. And I know, and I say that differently than that gratitude piece, which is really common. They always say, you know, bookend your days with gratitude. But joy is a little bit different. Absolute joy. Yesterday I was walking around Manitou Springs and I walked close to my house and there was this huge bird perched on my neighbor's wall. I think it was a hawk, and I'm going to confess I'm not entirely sure what it was. So I a lovely bird. <laughs> this thing was this big. It just sat there. It let me walk this close to it to take a picture of it. That, to me, was an incredible moment. And in that moment, I was like, wow, this is cool. I'm excited. I felt joy because I'm like, how often does that happen? And I know many of you live up here in this area. I'm sure, much like myself, you see deer all the time. They're so funny now. They basically will walk up to you, <laughs> right? But walking up to this bird, and I was so close to it, was amazing. Where do you experience joy? And at moment to moment, moment to moment. How can you maximize efficiency? These birds sit perch most of their day, but they do a lot, right? They do a lot. So when you're looking at managing time and when to stop, where can you maximize efficiency in your day? And if you just plant the question, and I wanna share this with you, and again, this is my experience. I have nothing to back it up, but I would love to know if anyone, when you ask yourself those questions, and then you just put it out there, where can I maximize efficiency in my day, and you go about your day, how many of you intuitively at some point get an answer? Right? If you just ask, and it doesn't mean you're gonna know in that moment, but I guarantee you, if you're like me, you'll wake up at 2.36 in the morning and you will have the answer to that question, right? Anyone get some of their best solutions in the middle of the night? <laughs> Literally in the middle of the night. And then you're so excited. I finally started Shower. going to bed with my phone and I put those solutions in the memos. So, Cause you go back to sleep and you're like, I don't wanna go to sleep because I'm gonna forget what I just thought of. So now I make sure I have, <laughs> Take note of it, even if it's in the middle of the night. How can I conserve my energy? These guys sleep in torpor. They sleep upside down in torpor, and you know what? You can walk up and poke them, and they won't wake up. Now you see why I picked the hummingbird for this, <laughs> this exercise? 
And lastly, when do you stop to rest? So to Stacy's point, she said, you know, do I keep going? Do I do more work? When, is, when are you hitting law of diminishing returns? And just say, I could do one more thing. I could do two more things. It's only 8.30 at night. I don't go to bed until 10 or 11. I could do more, right? At what point do you say, no, this is a stopping point. There's nothing to be gained tonight that can't wait until tomorrow. So when do you stop to rest? Okay. Any questions about this? Any thoughts? Want to check in, see where we're at? Feedback? Anyone? So I, you mentioned about the brain that doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. So I can sit and I can go through these questions and I can intellectualize them, but the reality is my brain just keeps going and mm -hmm. going and I'm not sure. Like if someone's like disconnected yeah. from me, yeah. and I'm not sure how to stop my brain. Okay, I, that is a great question. Does anyone else experience that? Okay. To a lesser degree. To a lesser degree. There is a, and I cannot think of it at the top of my head, there is a beginner meditation guide online. And the first thing, his like first, you can do like the first 10 meditation lessons for free. And the first one, he's, or one of the first ones, he's like, when you're trying to clear your mind, let your thoughts go through as though you're sitting watching traffic go by. There goes the yellow submarine. There goes the red VW. And just acknowledge and let it go. Don't go stop the car and go chat with the driver. Okay? Don't stop traffic, but just sit there in it. And actually, that is a good form of meditation. If you just set your, I set my phone, because I'm like, I have to know that I'm going to have a signal when I'm done with this exercise of trying to silent my mind. But even for 30 seconds to a minute, to start practicing that, I have a thought racing through my head. Just acknowledge and let it go. And I don't care if there's 50 of them. I don't care if someone is doing laps in the neighborhood and the same thought keeps coming again. Right? It's an exercise in learning to accept, acknowledge, and let it go. Don't try to shut it out. Those thoughts are there for a purpose. But again, you don't need to go stop the car and invite them into your house for a drink, okay? Okay. <laughs> we are now going to put this into action. See how, because another thing that will come to you when it comes to burnout is you want to indulge in creativity. Something intuitive, imaginative, and fun. And because I cannot play a musical instrument, it would have taken up too much space in my car to bring instruments in, we're gonna do this animal. Now you can pair up, you can do it on your own. So you're gonna blindly pick an animal out of here. <laughs> and you're gonna try to write a few questions, your life in regards to that animal. So I only have a few animals, so we may have to pair up, group up a bit, if you don't mind. Okay, we'll let you three or four here do this animal, whatever it is, yay. Got three more. <coughs> yeah, because that's just good. Come up with a couple of questions. We'll let you two do an animal. And then you, three or four back here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, just to be clear, do not stress and fret and think this is a test. <laughs> this is an opportunity to see how you can use this as an example. When you're feeling stressed, you've burned out, you're feeling bored, loss of, perceived loss of control, things are no longer aligned in your values, you haven't come across a great big bird on a walk or a deer, so you have no joy in your life, how can you compare yourself to traits of these animals? It can be physical or metaphorical, okay? So go ahead, take a few minutes. <laughs> Again, this is a creative exercise, another big activity to overcome burnout. Oh, okay. I can tell from the conversation that even though you may be talking about other things, at some point you've used this animal, correct? Right. Yeah? We did the animal. We did the animal. But, you know what? You were animated, you were being creative, you were collaborating, right? Yep. So these are great, great tools to think of, and we're going to talk about them more in a little bit. But everything that was just going on in those last seven minutes, 
are great exercises in addressing your symptoms of burnout. So now, I don't want to feel anyone put them on the spot, but who is going to volunteer to share some of the uh, questions that came up with Austin? Okay. okay. So we had a cow, and so we had, there was, there was a little bit of trying to figure out how cows work with us, and so uh, one of the ones that we kind of came up with and talked about was um, cows are used for graze animals. We use them for all of these different products, whether it's leather and milk and uh, meat, and it's like, how can I control how much of myself that I give to everybody? And then be able to create those tough spaces where I get back to myself and, and really honor who I am as like, that side of it as well. Um, and then another one was we were talking about how they're spotted. And so how do I get to a point of accepting all of the spots of who I am? And so sometimes mm -hmm. they're, you're, you're in the black spot where you're being nasty and you're awful. Mm -hmm. But you also have the spot where you're being 100% genuine like, and generous and caring. And how do I learn to accept all of those parts of who I am? Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think that was pretty good. Over yeah, <laughs> I know. Okay, thank you so much, Austin. Frank? Oh, yes. Uh, on the negative side, we've got these, this bad boy snap pretty easily. <laughs> and, that, uh, and he's kind of had a rough surface, so, you know, so we're a little bit skelly when we're stressed. <laughs> but the way that he deals with it and what we took a takeaway for us was that he's confident and he takes charge in his territory and his situation, uh, it's pretty relentless. So we're going after uh, our safe space, if you will, relentlessly. Uh, he's planning and he's organized. He knows exactly what he's going, particularly when he's hungry. So he's, <laughs> he's, uh, re he's patient and very decisive when they think of what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. So that's our takeaway from the Gator. Thank you very much. Does anyone else in your group have something to add to that? Okay. <laughs> All right, how about in the back there? Okay, we'll come back. We'll come back. Yes, James. We have the seal, so we're trying to figure out, trying to get out of your box, a comfort zone. So the seal, it says, where do you experience joy? That would be in the water. And it would be more efficient if it was in the water. Okay, how would you conserve energy? That would be floating on top of the water. Okay, but in our business, we're getting out of the water, okay, and we're trying to make sure we're not stuck in the mud. Okay, <laughs> we put a lot of effort in and we're not really moving as fast as we'd like to. And it'd be a lot easier just to go back to the water. <laughs> but we can't do that. We don't want to do that as business owners. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, James. Okay, how about back here? The first thing is um, about getting past the first impression. Um, when something seems scary or, you know, to take the time to really uh, get to know it and find out. She, she threw it out when you can <laughs> right. Not as scary and everything as they have the impression of being. Another thing was that it attacks methodically, kind of like the gator plans out what it's going to do before it opens its mouth and hurts somebody. <laughs> um, but it's graceful too. Um, and then right. you know, so what it's going to do. And then efficiency again, efficient movement so it maximizes energy and doesn't swing too fast all the time, but it has short bursts of energy when it's. Thank you. Okay. Do we have much Okay. I know your spokesperson is still out. So who, who wants to go ahead and share with us about the pig, the mama pig? Well, she's very protective of her children, which could also translate to protective over her own energy. Um, she's not picky in what she eats, so she minimizes those daily decisions. Um, <laughs> 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 right, excellent. Um, and she finds a lot of joy in the simple things like playing in the mud. <laughs> okay, so you can apply that to life. <laughs> excellent, thank you very much. And Marilee, I know you had the... No, I, I did. Oh, you did? <laughs> no, okay. We had another animal sheet. Okay. Anybody have a takeaway from that exercise? They want to share? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. We have control to even ask those questions and come up with those questions. So if, even understanding that you already have control of, that means there's a lot of other things you can control with in your life and being able to perceive that lack of control as not actually being there. Mm -hmm. Austin was saying the very fact that you have control over our being able to ask yourself those questions is a very small step in taking back that loss of perceived control, right? You really have more control over what's going on. That's where we go back to what I said. Sometimes, by default or design, we concede much of the control that we do have because we get so bogged down by the things that we think are happening and being done to us that we forget to see where we can make choices for us or where things are conspiring for our benefit, right? Shoot, and even in companies, even in the pharmaceutical company I worked for, many of those life-changing decisions I felt like were being done to me, quite frankly, if I'm honest, many of them were to my benefit. Many of them were to my benefit. But when you are so consumed by those that aren't, you it's hard to stop. It's hard to stop, especially when you get to that last piece. You've gone from bad attitude to buck mentality to just letting that hurricane out over the water again, and you lose control of it. All right, great. Thank you for engaging in that exercise. Okay, some more tools and resources. Let's talk about self-compassion and emotional balance. How many people think if you're engaged in a bad attitude and you have things going on in your life that are frustrating you, make you angry, you're impatient, that you are supposed to just ignore those feelings and not acknowledge that you feel them. I was raised to do that. You're raised mm -hmm. to, to hide them, to squash them. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Self-compassion, one of the greatest things you can do is to label the emotion. The reason they say, and I say this because this, again, this is um, not something I came up with myself, but self-compassion is to label the emotion. How many times have you exaggerated the emotion you were feeling. Oh, every time. Right? <laughs> so you take, oh, I'm slightly annoyed that um, the restaurant I ordered food at was has sold out of the thing I, I wanted, right? You could be annoyed. But how many people have decided like, oh my God, I was so upset, so angry. Like, we're all storytellers. We love to take this thing and boom, blow it up, right? So part of showing self-compassion is when you feel yourself having these states of emotion, label them accurately, and then acknowledge and accept them. You do not have to tell yourself, I'm just gonna put on a happy face and mull it over. Because what happens? And keep just putting the Band-Aid over something. Right? Gotta look underneath the surface. Gotta look underneath. Right? So you keep covering things up, keep sweeping things under the carpet. Anybody ever been in a relationship where you kept sweeping all that fun stuff under the carpet to keep the peace? Yes. How'd that work out? That's relationships at work too, I'm not just talking personal. Self-compassion and emotional balance. What are your strengths? Okay, how many of us tend to focus, do you focus on your weakest areas? on what's not getting done, where you're dropping the ball, where you believe you're failing as a parent, as a business owner, right? As a, a employee, as a daughter or a son, any of those things. Where do you just focus a lot of your energy on what you're not doing right instead of your strengths? Why do we not focus on what? And then you want to exploit your strengths. You know, leadership, classes often tell you you want to take somebody look at where they're strong and exploit the strengths don't try to take their weaknesses and make them their strength that is an exhausting effort on all sides correct mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so acknowledge yourself for your strengths creativity we just did an exercise in creativity the beauty of creativity is it puts you in a state of flow how many people play musical instruments I know Stacy plays piano Musical instruments. How many people are photographers, painters, writers, actors, performers of any kind, right? 
Would you say when you are engaged in the activity of your creativity, if you're being imaginative, if you're having fun, if you're being artistic on some level, if you're being intuitive, that you can get into that state of flow? And all those thoughts that were racing, driving by, are momentarily not there. Mm -hmm. Just last week, I did a small workshop on burnout, and one of the gentlemen there was a retired Air Force officer, and he was a musician. He had been a musician for many, many years. He started to lose his hearing. And he said, when I was playing, whether practicing on my own, I was with the band, I was performing, he was always, always in that state of flow. He was always able to tune out the noise. Then he started to lose his hearing and he really had to let some of that go. And his biggest issue of what was getting to him at the time of this workshop was now he's so in tune to all the external noise. And he's not talking about the external noise of his little circle of life. He's talking about media noise, the news, social media. What, he is so over aware and that is causing him an issue. So he needed another creative outlet, right? To turn out the noise, because he knows when he's in the flow of creativity, he can tune it out. So he has taken up photography. He goes hiking, he goes up into the mountains where he's just immersed in beauty and gorgeous. Anybody see the leaves turning recently? Yeah. Oh my gosh, just amazing. It was up Independence Pass last week and it was gorgeous. He goes hiking and he takes pictures. He has found another outlet to get in the flow. So if there's anything you do creative, creatively, that's a great way to tune out for a little bit and refuel and regroup, tune out the noise. And then there's connection. Have you ever found when you most need help, it is when you are least likely to ask for it? Yes. All right. Is it because you think it's a sign of weakness? You're too proud? You're ashamed by the fact that you might be, need help, right? Yeah. But when you need connection most is when you are down in that black hole and you are frustrated, you feel bored, you're feeling cynical, impatient, your health is failing, all these things that come with burnout. When you most need that support, right, that collaboration, right, that's when you need that connection and you are least likely to ask for it. Least likely to ask for it. Why is that? What he says, you're so overwhelmed and confused. It's just like your clouded vision. You can't even right. get to that point. You know, you're basically just trying to get through the day. That is a great, I like that. Because what you're saying is sometimes you're so far down there, and correct me if I'm misinterpreting, maybe you don't even know what you would ask for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. That is when sometimes it is okay if you have that touch point. It can be a family member, it can be a friend, a neighbor, someone you work with. It can be a pet. Where you just connect and you don't have to say anything. Right? But just know, I need to connect. How can I do that? Even if I'm not sure what help I might ask for. Right? Just well, connect. Also like a question how do you need help? How do you need help? One bite at a time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yes. We didn't have an elephant as part of our exercise, so that would have been ideal. <laughs> so I want to share another story with you of burnout that you would not necessarily, on the face of it, think of burnout. One of my early clients, Sarah, came to me and said, I want to hire you because I want to lose 15 pounds. So on the outset, the perception is she's hiring a coach to help her lose weight that she's been unable to lose, right? The next thing out of her mouth was, and I'm not ready to change anything about how I eat, <laughs> okay? So what do you think I said? We're not a good fit. <laughs> what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? What will you do? Not would, could, or should, what will you do to start losing weight? And I said, I will not bring up food again until you do. So we engaged in this whole coaching scenario for a little bit of time based on weight loss. But the more we talked and had coaching sessions, guess what came to light? Single mom, 
trying to reconnect a relationship that had been toxic, but she couldn't quite completely dismiss it. They had gotten divorced and then they were trying to reconcile, which is great, right? Um, she was in a job that not only was she in a cubicle and just, I mean, on her way to work, her blood pressure would come up to here. She also didn't get to dress how she wanted to dress. Um, she wasn't, didn't have a creative outlet. She was a writer. She lacked confidence. She wasn't going to apply to a master's program she wanted because she didn't think she'd get accepted. So she was fear of rejection, right? So over the course of this few, first month or two, we are focused on the weight loss. And then as we engage, it came up like her weight gain had been in this period by which was an indecision about a relationship. She was at a job she didn't like. She is a single mother with an adolescent boy about to be a teenager. <laughs> There's some parents of teenagers out there, I can tell, or have had them, right? She was overwhelmed. She was frustrated. She was disillusioned. She lacked three things that most people want. She lacked confidence confidence and autonomy and she felt she was stuck to her credit the one thing she said I will do I will walk 10,000 steps a day so what was she engaging in motion. motion when you feel stuck the first thing to do is to move interestingly enough over the course of the next year she ended the toxic relationship finally for good it was a resolution that was best for everybody concerned did not have the some horrible nasty ending right she applied for the master's program and was accepted she started a new healthy relationship with more appropriate boundaries and she got her dream job where she still is today so what we found is Though she started this whole coaching process from a standpoint of weight loss, over time she realized like, oh my gosh, it's just a symptom of the stuck feeling and disillusionment I feel in my life. She was burned out and that was what she started with. And I bring that story to light because some of you may think, I'm going to solve this other outline issue first and it will be the catalyst by which it brings you out of your burnout. So there's no magical way. You don't have to sit there and consciously sit in your chair and go, I am burnt out. These are my symptoms. What do I do? Sometimes it's, it comes to you in other ways. And that's great. Because over time, as you work through it, you start with what you will do. And that's what I, when I said, I, you know, I want to answer all your questions. But I told you from the onset, you are not going to leave here with me giving you a, a list of, if I were you, I would do this. Because if I were you, I may do something totally different. And back to my burnout story that I shared with you. I have been now a solopreneur. I left pharmaceuticals just over two years ago. And in full disclosure, I have experienced burnout in those two years. I have been where you're at, Stacey, where I'm like, I have so much to bring and nobody seems to be interested. But you said only 50 people changed their mind. What about the 50 that showed up? It's, I know that's where I need to Mm -hmm. but I get stuck in the hurt. Uh, yep, it's very personal. Absolutely. And is there any parent, business owner, solopreneur who cannot relate to that? Here I am showing up and I have so much to give and I'm trying to be of great service and value to it and phew, crickets, right? Okay? So I have experienced that and so my point is I created a system for myself. So when I have those moments, sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's three or four days, occasionally it's been longer. But I know I have my system by which I mitigate the significance of it and I'm able to come back. All right. So, everyone, part of what we feel is your um, daily activities are no longer aligned with your values, your goals no longer resonate with you. You're looking at big, broad picture, right? Big picture? What if you were to bring it in and say, just today, I got out of bed this morning, what is something that can give my life meaning and purpose today, no matter how small? No matter how small. 
pare it down to the smallest incremental thing, right? Stop looking at this big picture because that to me just adds to the overwhelm. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like, where am I supposed to be in six months or a year? It's great to have that out here, but on a daily basis, find meaning and purpose. Anybody want to share their meaning and purpose for today? Yes. New event. My mom. Thank you. Yes. So that's your meaning purpose to show up here to support and maybe learn something, right? Every Monday I say, I survived another week. <laughs> so it maybe some of these tools will help you have shift from survivor to thriver, you know, and make that shift a little bit at a time. That might not be a realistic benchmark yet. Okay. No, I didn't say I said not yet. Just been thinking. Anyone else want to share the purpose or meaning for today? Yes. I just bought my Halloween costume, you know, and set to it, anticipating being with kids, or being silly, and, you know, just looking forward to that moment. Good, being silly over the holidays, looking forward to the joy of the kids at Halloween. Frank, thank well, you. Yeah, daily, I'm sitting with people that are in this place, so some takeaways for me is uh, some recognition and some opportunities that I might gather and work that I do to help better. Excellent. So how to add value to the service you bring to people every day. I always have something to look forward to. Okay. And to focus on that. Yep. The other thing is, in the words of Scott Adams, who does anybody know the comic strip Dilbert? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. He wrote a book, How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Greatly. Okay, and he talks about focus on systems so you can acknowledge process. So here is your big goal. I want to have a thriving business, right? And every day that you don't have a thriving business, you sink deeper into that black hole. However, if you put a system in place, this week I'm going to do these things to move the needle, right? And you're focused on that system because he says when, all you're, when you're only focused on the outcome, you're in a constant state of pre-success failure. Constant state of pre-success failure. But if you put a system in place, then you can acknowledge at the end of the week, what did I accomplish? Focus first on what you did do. And that's what so often we focus on the negative, what didn't happen, what we didn't do. And it is, I don't know if it's an innate thing or a culture. How many of you have ever asked someone's opinion of a movie and they're like, yeah, I saw that movie. And if it was horrible, you will get a 30-minute review of that movie. <laughs> yeah. The acting was horrible. The lighting was bad. Oh, for God's sake, the soundtrack. They couldn't find anyone better than that. They will go on and on and on. But if they like the movie, what will they say? It was great. It was great. Oh, you don't want to hear too much details. So they keep doing watching. Yes. <laughs> so you don't have to. You can see that whole movie, right? So when you focus on a system, what I'm saying, the whole reason I brought up that point is at the end of the week, I want you to focus on what was positive first. That is not to sweep what didn't happen under the rug or to not acknowledge in name some frustration or lack of progress, but start, because when you start with the positive, just by divine intervention, it is going to mitigate the impact of the negative. If any of you have been managers, in leadership positions, were you not trained to do that two to one ratio, two positives to a growth opportunity? <laughs> Sandwich. Sandwich. Sandwich it. Right. You got to do the same with yourself. Sandwich. Put that growth opportunity somewhere in the murky middle where you can forget about it. Okay. Here's another one. I started this one because keep a fresh perspective. This is twofold. We're running out of time, but I really, really want to share with you another story. Renee. Renee did an all-day coaching session with me. She signed up for a six-hour day with me. She walked in the door. We had talked on the phone twice, never met once in person. She walks in the door and burst into tears. That was the beginning of our first six hours. Right? She had recently been promoted to a position um, and was great. I mean, people spend their whole life trying to get to these positions, right? And she had 65 subordinates. And two of them, 
every morning just set her off just by their mere greeting. She would walk in and they, one of them would say, how nice of you to show up. And that would just <gasps> suck the life right out of her. Her energy was just gone. She ended up coming in later, staying later, so she wouldn't have that interaction. She ended up going home, hanging out on the couch, stopped working out, stopped socializing, all the things that made her feel connected to life. You would say she's burned out, exhibiting signs of burnout, right? So she went on and on, and I said, do you mind engaging in an exercise with me? Just for curiosity. And I said, when these people, when you walk in the door of your office, and the first thing someone says to you, specifically one of these two people, how nice of you to show up. What are you saying to yourself in your head? How are you identifying yourself? And then, how does how you're identifying yourself at that moment informing how you behave or how you react, right? And then the outcome is always the same, right? It sucks the life out of your day. You don't want to be there. It puts you in a negative piece of the day. You stay late so you don't have to interact with people. You go home, you sit on your couch, you no longer socialize. Now let me ask you this, Renee. How would you like that to be different? What outcome would you like? So you start there. And then from there you're going, now you know what your trigger is. Your trigger is someone saying good morning, but instead of good morning, how nice of you to show up. And I said, just for fun, what if you were to shift your perspective in that moment of how you identified yourself? What have you been like, it is absolutely good of me to show up. Yeah. I bring a lot to the table. You are lucky I'm here, and I'm going to provide so much service and value to those of you on my team and our patients. How would your behavior be different? Right? right? How would the outcome be different? You would show up at work. You would go home at the end of the day, leave it at the office, go engage in being social because she's an extroverted person. You would work out, get back in her words, fighting shape, right? Mm -hmm. And she goes, Melissa, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. She goes, but you know what? I don't want to give those two people that much control. And you know what I said? I said, do you mind if I make an observation? She's like, okay. I said, you have been talking about these two people for three hours of the six you're paying me for. Guess what? Oh, they already have it. You have already conceded control, right? She already gave it away. And she was like, wow. She just, that is what it means to have a fresh perspective. This to me is a huge point. So any questions, comments, anything, any takeaways from this? I just been experiencing that fresh perspective recently and I'm getting back to my outgoing self and it's amazing to not let those people from way back here to again have that control in your head. Mm -hmm. Yes. It really changes. And take it back. And back to where we started. You see now where I said our perceived loss of control and where we start to conceive the rest of it. Right? It's so easy to do. So easy to do. And I want to finish this in the words of Neil Donald Walsh. When you are in that dark hole and you're asking yourself, ask yourself, what do I need in this moment? What I love about, so, and, and then intuitively you will be given a response to what you need and you should act on it. But what I love about what he says is give what you most need. Give what you most need. If you are lacking confidence, Support someone else. Give them confidence. If you are lacking confidence, acknowledge other people's confidence. If you are lacking connection and support and trust and loyalty, or just a connection of any kind, give what you most need. Any questions? All right. Thank you guys so much for engaging and your support. I want to respect your time. This was go till 10:30. Um, 
you have any questions, let me know. But anybody have any last minute takeaways or comments they'd like to share? What's the 80% rule? 80% 80% rule is that you have control over 80% things in your life. And that's those basics we talked about. You have control over how you eat, how you sleep, how you perceive things, um, motion, daily decision making. Actually, most of your life, 80% of things in your daily life you actually have control over. Any other questions? Thank you, Stacy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, have a wonderful day. Thank you again. Appreciate your being engaged.